All right, let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 18. As we're coming toward the end of the book, Revelation 18. We'll be starting with uh, verse number 8 today, starting with verse number 8. A little bit of background. We see here Babylon, and uh, Babylon, as we've discussed before, is the world or humanity organized against God and his people. Uh, a warning is given in Revelation 18.4. It's a warning to you and a warning to me. And that is, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. And so as we see the world system all around us, Babylon, we are commanded by God to come out and be separated from it, to be different. Because the world is going to try to get you to participate in sin which is rebellion against God, rebellion against his word. And when you participate in sin, then you're going to face God's judgment. So come out. It's like that uh, Patch the Pirate song. If you want to make a difference, you've got to be a little different. That's just the way it is. You've got to be different. You've got to come out from Babylon. Because Babylon is going to be destroyed. Whenever we rebel against God, there is always judgment and destruction in the future. And we see it can come very quickly. Verse number 8. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. We noted last time that when the phrase one day is used, Later, they're going to use the phrase one hour. It means suddenly, very quickly. Things can happen very quickly. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I think the man in this parable is very uh, suitable when talking about prosperous Babylon. Prosperous Babylon. The spirit of Babylon is definitely in this man in Luke chapter 12. Beginning verse 16. And Jesus spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, Thus will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, I told Miss Tressy, she was talking about someone, you know, wanting to retire and get an RV and travel all over the country. I said, anytime I hear that, a red flag always comes up. <laughs> Because you had all these people waiting to retire and travel and do all these things. But let me tell you something. You're not in control. I'm not in control. And that's exactly what this rich man learns here. He says, I've got all this stuff. What should I do with it? Well, what he should have said is, well, I see my neighbor is in need. I have more than enough for me. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give. I'm going to show the love of God to other people. But instead, he said, I need bigger barns. I need bigger storehouses. And I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry, and just live comfortably the rest of my life. And yet in one day, suddenly, something happened to this rich man. It says, verse 20, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul should be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Is there a better verse that describes Babylon here? Wealthy Babylon, who in one day, one day, is going to be destroyed. It says here, in one day, death and mourning and famine 
she shall be utterly burned with fire. You say, how can this happen? Babylon is the most wealthy, most powerful nation on the earth, on the planet. It's led by the most powerful, greatest man to ever live. A guy that some people affectionately call the beast. <laughs> you know, the Antichrist. He, he's leading this nation. How can this be? How is it that you can be going along, sinning against God, and all of a sudden, everything just collapse before your eyes? Well, look at the last phrase in verse number 8. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. Babylon may be great, but her strength is nothing compared with the power of God. If I was an evangelist, I could point out here, you may think you're great, but you're nothing compared with omnipotent, all-powerful God. So verse number 9, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her, and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. And what does the word deliciously mean? Do you remember that? It means what? Luxuriously. Luxuriously. That's right. Here they have the kings of the earth, the powerful people in this world, have enjoyed her luxuries. And they're weeping for her when they see the smoke of her burning rising up. Or destruction. Verse 10. They were standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Alas, alas. These are words that are used to describe mourning over a loved one. Oh, alas, alas. That great city, that mighty city, <laughs> in spite of its greatness, in spite of its strength, in one hour is thy judgment come. Sudden, divine destruction. We look at the powers of the age. We see the powerful nations. We even see our own mighty United States of America. And yet, as mighty as she might be, in an instant, God can destroy her. And God can do that to any nation that rebels against him. And he will do it to the greatest nation that will ever have existed, and that is the end times Babylon. <clears throat> Verses 11 through 15 describes Babylon. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Here's some of the merchandise, some of the things that were traded. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all finine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood of brass and iron and marble, cinnamon, odors, ointments, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, and beast, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. <clears throat> the word slaves here means bodies. Uh, in the end time, there's some form of slavery that's going to come back. And Babylon will be trading slaves. We don't know exactly what that means, but we do see that in verse number 13. It says, And the fruits that thy soul lusteth after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. What do we see? Babylon is permanently 
out of business. You know, there might be a store or a restaurant that you remember from your youth, and you say, wow, I'm going to go there and eat again, relive some memories, or I'm going to go to shop there. They always had such a selection that I liked. And you go to Google and you say, Google, you know, you, you, you say the name of the store and the location, and they have a little X there or something that says permanently out of business. <laughs> well, that's what you're going to see if you Google Babylon, you're going to see permanently out of business. It's gone. This, uh, this economic engine that was driving the world economy, you know, this military powerhouse that was dominating the kings, the rulers of this world, in an instant, it's gone. It's gone. Verse 16, here are the merchants of the earth. They're saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Alas, alas. Once again, the words used to mourn a loved one. You know, when your whole way of living is destroyed, when that which you relied upon for security is destroyed, you're all tore up. And again, verse 17, For in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea <coughs> stood afar off. What's the phrase that jumps out here? In one hour, again, suddenly, this is going to happen. Out of the blue, as they used to say. Verse 18, and they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? <laughs> what city? How can we replace Babylon? There's no city that could be any better than Babylon. Oh, just think about it in the Bible a couple of chapters later. What city is going to come down? New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. That's right. Oh, far greater. Far greater than Babylon. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. It's an admonition to us. And Babylon is an illustration of this truth. Matthew 6, beginning of verse 19. Jesus instructs us. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What are you living for today? This is the question in, in Revelation as it's written to these seven churches. What are you living for today? That which is going to pass away, Babylon, or that which is forever, the new Jerusalem? Verse 19. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, These merchants, what are they going to do? Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. I think I see a theme here. Alas, alas, mourning for a loved one. In one hour, this one who was loved had a sudden death, destruction. The whole earth is mourning. But what's heaven's reaction? Let's go to heaven. You want to go with me? Here's a ticket. Let's go to heaven. All right, verse number 20. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. That nation, that force, 
that stood against God and his people is destroyed. And what is heaven doing? Rejoicing. Rejoicing. That's right. It says, you holy apostles and prophets, God has avenged you on her. The phrase avenge you on her means judged your judgment upon her. In other words, here it is. Babylon has persecuted you. Babylon has killed you. And now what Babylon has done to you is being judged on Babylon. And we remember earlier it said here it's going to be double. Double the judgment. Look at uh, Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Words of Jesus here. Matthew 23, verses 29 through 36. Woe unto you, Jesus says, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And you say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify. Some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city city what is he saying here he's saying your fathers your ancestors persecuted the men of god persecuted the prophets and yet you have the audacity to make the tombs of these prophets very beautiful and to say oh if we had lived back in those times we would have never acted like them. You know, that's one of the falsehoods of our age, is it not? People go back 50 years or 100 years or 200 years or whatever it may be. And they say, oh, if we'd have lived back then, <laughs> we wouldn't have acted like that. <laughs> People go back to the uh, children of Israel in the wilderness. And they say, I don't understand why they didn't believe God. They go to the book of Judges and they say, oh, I don't know why there's always a cycle, why they were always turning away from God. And what Jesus is saying is, you are just like your ancestors. Prophets come to you, such as John the Baptist, and you kill them. The greatest prophet, the Son of God, comes to you, and what are you going to do with him? You're going to crucify him. And you scourge people, and you persecute people who are godly. And in verse number 35, tells what's going to happen. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. And sure enough, those who crucified the Lord Jesus Christ in AD 70, the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem and judgment was foisted upon them. Listen, you don't mess with God and you don't mess with his people because God will judge you. And whether it's the, the harlot in Revelation 17 that represents spiritual Babylon, or whether it's the beast in his nation of Revelation 18, also Babylon, when they messed with God's people and they persecuted God's people, then guess what? God takes that personally, and he is going to make them repay. 
And when he does, heaven rejoices. Verse number 21 of Revelation 18. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and be found no more at all. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 51. It's amazing how similar Jeremiah 51 is to Revelation 18 here. Jeremiah 51, verses 60 through 64. <clears throat> now listen to these words. See, Revelation takes from these Old Testament prophets. You can't properly understand Revelation unless you understand the Old Testament prophets. It says here, verse 60. So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon. Whoa, even the same name. <laughs> Even all these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, When thou comest to Babylon, and shalt see, and shalt read all these words, then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates. So you take this book of judgment against Babylon, tie a big rock to it, and then throw it into the Euphrates River. Now listen to this. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. It's amazing, isn't it? Babylon is like a millstone being cast into the sea. She is going to be gone for good because she refused to repent and to turn to God through his son, Jesus Christ. So verse 22 says, In the voice of harpers and musicians, and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. You know, I don't know if John got to <laughs> hear the modern music scene or not. But if he did, he heard all kind of music. <laughs> all kind of music, you know. And all of a sudden, for the first time, there's dead silence. You know, they say that New York City is the city that never sleeps. 24-7, you can find some way to entertain yourself. Well, Babylon is kind of like that. But you know what? There's no music. There's no Broadway. No entertainment. Nothing. There's not even, it talks about a millstone, shall be heard no more at all in thee. There's nobody working. There's nothing happening in Babylon. God has judged her. No noise coming from this evil place anymore. Verse 23. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all the nations deceived. You know, you think about a place like New York City. And you see it at night. It's a wonderful thing. I remember our family drove through there at night. And to see all those lights in New York City. It's so bright, it's so shiny. I'm sure Babylon was like that. And yet now what? It says here, not even the light of a candle can be seen in Babylon. Total darkness. Total silence. And why is it that this happened to Babylon? We see the answer to that in verse number 24. 
And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Why is it that Babylon was destroyed? Because she had killed the preachers, she had killed the Christians, and she had slaughtered the innocent. And God was going to avenge that. You know, we're to pray in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that God would allow us in the nation we live in to live quiet and peaceable lives with all godliness and honesty. And as pagan as a nation may be, as long as that nation allows Christians to be able to live peaceful lives and to serve God and to live out their faith without persecution, then God allows that nation to continue. But once that nation turns against God and his people and begins to persecute them and begins to kill them, once a nation starts killing the innocent, like we're doing, with the slaughter of unborn children through abortion, and God takes notice. And God is not going to let that go on forever. And suddenly, when you least expect it, in one day, in one hour, Babylon is destroyed. The system of this world that sets itself up against God and his anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ, and against God's people, is going to be destroyed. And as we get a sneak peek into chapter 19, we see the folks in heaven saying, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah. Verse 4, Hallelujah. <laughs> Verse 5, Praise our God. Verse 6, Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice. And next time, Lord willing, we will look at the marriage supper of the Lamb. What a wonderful time of praising God and rejoicing. Babylon is destroyed, and Christ is getting ready to come and set up his kingdom on this earth.